Okay, so phase one is done. We've completed our work in the PACU and the patient is going to be transported to the medical surgical unit um, as an inpatient. So we've given our handoff report to the, from the PACU nurse to the inpatient nurse. And when you, as the inpatient nurse, first receive a post-op patient onto your unit, these are the kind of things you're going to want to do. You're going to want to know what your orders are, reviewing the parameters that the physician has set. So they'll say something like, call if the systolic blood pressure is over 180 or if the diastolic is less than 60. You know, you'll have these parameters that you know when the doctor needs to be notified of something. So you need to know those vital sign parameters. Um, you'll need to know what kind of activity the patient's allowed to do. Are they up as ad lib? Do they need a walker? Um, are they bed bound? What kind of diet are they on? Typically patients are started on a clear liquids diet and then are um, slowly uh, advanced to a full liquid diet and then back to a general diet or whatever their typical diet would be. So you wanna consider what the orders are for that. You wanna know what your orders are for pain, nausea and vomiting control. You wanna have those orders right away so that you can help the patient as they have those issues. And then the first thing you need to know as your inpatient nurse is do your assessment, get your full set of vitals on that patient and do your full head to toe assessment so you know what you're working with. So some of the post-op complications that you should consider when you are an inpatient nurse in that phase two of recovery are things like atelectasis. Atelectasis means a lack of um, getting air down deep into the lungs. And then those lung sacs in the very bottom of the lung just kind of deflate, all the ovuli deflate and they're not getting good um, um, movement of air. And so what can happen with that is things like pneumonia. So we don't wanna have any complications like another infection now that the patient um, is trying to recover from surgery. So something we do to help prevent atelectasis and prevent pneumonia is encouraging the patient to take deep breaths and cough. And we can also encourage them to use an incentive spirometer. I usually like to tell my patients, you know, use this 10 times every time a commercial comes on TV. And that helps them take nice deep breaths. Um, and we wanna watch our patients for pain. Sometimes patients won't wanna take deep breaths because it hurts. And so making sure your patients are adequately medicated for pain and in teaching them why it's so important to take those deep breaths. The last thing here is about pulmonary embolisms, clots that can form in your lungs or get thrown to your lungs. And patients are usually on some kind of preventative prophylactic uh, medication or, or SCDs, so sequential uh, compression devices to help prevent, especially those blood clots in your legs that can then travel to your lungs. And so uh, you'll wanna know what are we doing to prevent clotting for this patient? Are we giving a sub-Q heparin every day or are we putting them on SCDs that are gonna just kind of squeeze their patient's legs to keep blood flow circulating there? So you to know what your plan is to prevent embolisms. So we just talked about those respiratory complications for the inpatient unit. Let's think about some of the other systems that have complications. So anytime we're talking about cardiovascular complications, our patients are at risk after surgery for fluid and electrolyte imbalances, tachycardia, vasoconstriction, dehydration, a lack of uh, fluid or blood loss from the surgery or clot formation. So you're gonna to wanna to be doing a good cardiovascular and skin assessment to watch for signs of good perfusion, um, watching their blood, their vital signs to make sure they're within normal ranges and looking at those lab results as it pertains to electrolytes. And it's putting this whole picture together between your nursing assessments, your vital signs and what you're getting back in your lab results. In terms of neurologic complications, our, our elderly patients are more likely to have neurologic complications after surgery, specifically delirium. Um, and that can happen in our elderly population due to metabolic changes or just the fact that they're hospitalized, hospitalized at all. And we can do things like provide redirection um, and reorientation. And if necessary, we may need to use medications like Haldol or haloperidol, um, which can help calm down that patient to avoid any complications from their delirium. Another thing we can see in our elderly, elderly patients is post-operative cognitive decline. Um, and this can be temporary lasting from weeks to months and cause a hard time with just slowness cognitively. Uh, when my dad had his, uh, my dad's a very sharp 
very, very smart person, active, playing tennis, and he had a quintuple bypass after having a massive heart attack. And afterwards, he was in rehab, and I got to go to one of his speech therapy um, sessions, and they were working on cognitive things like filling out a clock, the numbers on a clock, or um, you know, having a grocery list and having to add up the numbers to calculate how much you would spend that day at the grocery store. And these are very simple things. And my dad's a really smart person. And it was so alarming to me to see him really struggle with just these basic things like filling out a clock or adding up numbers from a grocery list. Um, and this is that post-operative cognitive decline, just lack of a little bit of blood flow to his brain, having those anesthesia meds just kind of hanging out in an elderly patient for a little longer. And after a few weeks, my dad improved and is now back to normal, but it's something to consider um, that they, patients who are elderly after surgery may not immediately return back to their initial cognitive function. Now, in terms of gastrointestinal um, function, post-operative ileus, paralytic ileus, where the gut just slows or even stops working, um, is common with GI symptom, common with GI surgeries, um, but can really happen from other surgeries as well. And it is complicated by things like the anesthesia, the lack of mo mobility. Remember, we've talked about how um, elimination and mobility go so hand in hand. So the lack of uh, mobility, the anesthesia, all the opioids that slow down the gut, um, and it can all really impact the patient to have the risk for having a post-operative ileus or a slowing down of the gut. Um, so we wanna watch this by listening to bowel sounds and assessing that the abdomen is soft, non-firm, non-distended, if it's looking bloated or the patient um, is unable to pass gas or they haven't had a bowel movement in a while, or you're not hearing um, you know, normal active bowel sounds, these should all alert you to post-operative ileus. And patients with op post-operative ileus are usually kept NPO, nothing by mouth, um, until their bowel starts moving again. Another problem patients can have is with their urinary system, specifically with urinary retention, unable to void. Now, this happens from a few reasons. The anesthesia itself um, depresses the nervous system, which can affect the nervous system's control of voiding. Um, there's also this decreased sensation of a full bladder, which can cause this uh, urinary retention. And then this combined with the opioids that are used for pain control and the immobility after surgery can all complicate and lead to urinary retention. So one of the things that post-op nurses want to see is that the patient voids before they go home. And typically, if there's a certain amount of time that goes by and they're not able to void, they'll just go ahead and either straight cath them or put in a Foley catheter temporarily until that bladder just kind of wakes up. Now, certainly every patient who undergoes some kind of surgery is going to have some sort of incision, whether it's a laparoscopic surgery where they're just making tiny incisions and using cameras on, in, the, the, in the stomach or in the abdomen to visualize without making huge cuts, or sometimes it's an open procedure and they're making big cuts. Either way, we've, we're dealing with, um, with, with surgical incisions. And so we're looking at that the wound edges are approximated together. The risk there is that there's dehiscence where those edges separate. Um, either the sutures or staples can fall out. Um, and that can be a complication for wound, poor wound healing and risk for infection. Now keep in mind that the surgeon is the one who always changes that first dressing. So nurses don't touch that first dressing. The surgeon does that first one and then we take over after that. But wound uh, dressing should always be dry and clean. A dirty, wet wound dressing isn't going to provide a barrier from bacteria. So those are some of the things we're gonna look at is the, is the dressing dry and intact. And then once we do see that surgical incision, are the wound edges approximated, put together, or is there any dehiscence? And then we want to consider um, any surgical drains, like JP drains that the surgeon might have left in, looking for any output from those and how those are looking, looking for redness, swelling, and any drainage that's, uh, um, that's present. So here's just a reminder from way back in fundamentals when we talked about wound healing. So dehiscence is when the, the skin itself separates from that wound. Um, and then evisceration is worse. That's when um, an organ actually comes through and protrudes through the muscle. So for example, a bowel um, protruding, um, which is a higher complication, a much more of a surgical emergency versus the dehiscence. And certainly the dehiscence, the severity is gonna depend on how much 
skin has um, dehissed or how much is still approximated. Okay, so we're just going to review all of the nursing assessments that you would make on, in the inpatient unit for a post-op patient. And then we're going to talk about the actions you'll take as an inpatient nurse and then talk about discharge teaching. So in terms of assessments, remember, we're looking for the rest, we're really doing a head to toe assessment um, and talking about the respiratory system, looking at their vital signs, that they have good peripheral perfusion. And we check that through peripheral pulses, like radial pulses and pedal pulses. Um, do they have good neurostatus? Are they alert? Are they oriented times four? Um, or are they confused and delirious? Um, do they have a good gastrointestinal mobility? motility, sorry. So are you listening? Do they have good bowel sounds? Are they having any, um, passing any stool? Are they passing urine? And if so, are they getting at least one ml per kilo per hour? What color is it? Is there any pain when they urinate? How does their skin look? Are the wounds edges approximated? Are the dressings clean and dry? Do they have any drains present? Is their pain under control? And if not, what are you going to do about it? And then checking their fluid status. Do they have good skin turgor, good urine output, checking the moist mucous membranes in their mouth. And then looking at their labs for those electrolytes to make sure that those are within normal range. In terms of nursing actions, if you are an inpatient nurse and you're taking care of a post-op patient, these are the kinds of things you need to do. Uh, provide respiratory care, encouraging that deep, deep breathing and coughing to help avoid analectasis. Provide fluid management. Sometimes we need to give fluids on IV. We want to look for signs of fluid volume overload where we need to back off on that. We want to assess the patient's mobility and their ability to get around. Um, or what are we doing to prevent DVTs, those blood clots in their legs? Are we using sequential compression devices? Are we giving them um, heparin shots? What's their diet and are we advancing that? Uh, how does their skin look on their surgical site? Are we avoiding pressure injuries? Remember that from fundamentals, that core idea about skin integrity, making sure we're turning our patients, watching for those bony prominences, um, assessing for fall risks, managing constipation, and getting that Foley catheter out as soon as we can, because the longer that's in, the longer the chance that they are gonna have a, a, a risk for a urinary tract infection from that catheter. And then finally, what are we gonna teach these patients? Well, we're gonna talk about orientation to the unit. Here's the call light, here's my number, here's my whiteboard, here's my name. These are the things we're doing for you um, and kind of getting them used to the unit. Talking about safety, like call, don't fall. Um, making sure that they're um, you know, not straining when they go to the bathroom and other things that are gonna help open up those wound incisions. And then we're gonna start talking about discharge education, assessing their ability, what they've got going on at home and what kind of teaching they're gonna need because we want to move them to phase three. So that's what we're doing now is getting them through that second phase so that they're ready to go to phase three at home. And that's gonna do it uh, for our post-op care lecture. Thank you so much for studying as always, and I'll see you next time.